Hello, this is Celia Lacayo, again, uh, Associate Director of Community Engagement and Professor in the Chicana Studies Department, as well as the African American Studies. Um, today we have Amada Armenta from Urban Planning UCLA, Associate Professor, um, who's gonna talk to us about very key components about Latino and Latino immigrants and law enforcement, which is a timely matter. Um, hi, Amada, how are you today? Hi, Celia, I'm great, thanks for asking. Wonderful, so great to have you on. So we wanna start uh, with asking, what are some of the major changes to immigration enforcement over the last several years? You know, if you look back and just think about, you know, three years ago or four years ago during the last election season, when Trump promised to build a wall, um, you know, he really came to dominate the news waves by the talk of this wall, right? So now we're three years into the Trump presidency. We know that he's largely not succeeded at building physical barriers, but he has succeeded in creating what scholars are calling an invisible wall. Um, and that's because of the way that he's dramatically closed down legal avenues to entry through um, executive orders, rule changes and proclamations. And so legal avenues to entry are way down um, and immigration enforcement is as you know ramped up as ever. So a couple of the major changes are that towards the end of the Obama administration, people had really pushed um, the immigration enforcement bureaucracy to enforce immigration laws according to some priorities. So, you know, the United States federal government doesn't have unlimited resources to do immigration enforcement, so bureaucracies always have to exercise discretion. Um, the pushback then was to protect, um, you know, long-standing immigrant residents, people with temporary protected status, um, people with DACA from deportation, and to concentrate removals um, for people who had committed, you know, serious crimes. Um, one of the first things that the Trump administration did was remove immigration enforcement priorities so that anybody could be a priority for immigration enforcement. And as a result, people started getting um, picked up for removal at courthouses. Um, they started getting put into removal proceedings during immigration interviews. Now applying for citizenship can get you put into proceedings under particular um, circumstances. Basically what Trump has done is turned every arm of the immigration bureaucracy, even ones that used to be um, providing services into immigration enforcement mechanisms. Thank you. Um, and so along those lines, can you um uh, tell us a little bit more specifically how do local law enforcement agencies uh, participate participate in immigration enforcement? Yes, so this is uh, actually a little complicated and it's a politically contentious issue. So in the US, the federal government has um, plenary power over immigration enforcement. That just means that they're supposed to be the sole agency in charge of immigration enforcement. Local law enforcement agencies enforce state and local laws. And since immigration laws are federal laws, um, usually state and local law enforcement agencies should have no role in, um, in policing federal immigration laws. Now where it gets sort of tricky and complicated is that for the last 25 years, um, federal immigration enforcement the federal immigration enforcement bureaucracy has used the criminal justice system to um, identify people for removal. So for example, they do immigration enforcement screenings in prisons and in jails. And so then the local law enforcement agencies can start um, sort of participating in immigration enforcement through their decisions about who to arrest. Um, and in those cases, local law enforcement agencies might think that they're not participating in immigration enforcement because they're not technically enforcing immigration laws. They're enforcing laws um, that many immigrants, particularly undocumented immigrants, find impossible to comply with. So for example, um, in over 40 states in the US, uh, 
legal presence is a requirement for driver's licenses. So if you were to be arrested for driving without a license, you might get put into um, immigration enforcement or deportation proceedings. Other ways that local law enforcement agencies can participate in immigration enforcement are through um, official partnerships with the federal government, such as a program called 287G that allows uh, local law enforcement agencies to apply to work with the federal government on immigration enforcement. Um, right now, there's around between 70 and 80 uh, counties that participate in 287G, and the number has increased since uh, the Trump administration started. And then the last way that local law enforcement agencies can participate in immigration enforcement is through honoring something called ICE detainers. So immigration detainers are uh, requests from the federal government to hold people in usually jails um, until the immigration customs enforcement can assume custody. And it, they have to do this within 48 hours. Now it's not a legal requirement, you know, you don't, um, a local agency doesn't have to hold people for ICE, but many do because they, um, they believe in immigration enforcement, maybe they think it's a professional courtesy, or they think that immigrants are dangerous and should be removed. You know, people have a lot of different kinds of motivations, but when they hold people for the immigration enforcement bureaucracy, they're also um, cooperating with immigration enforcement. So this is all to say, you know, there's a lot of um, states and cities in the United States that think of themselves as sanctuary cities. So these are cities that, or you know, the entire state of California is a sanctuary state, for example, where there are rules about the police not being allowed to cooperate with immigration enforcement um, and local agencies not being allowed to cooperate with immigration enforcement. And these are very important policies. Um, but because of the ways that um, undocumented immigrants in particular are outside of the law, where many of their everyday activities are criminalized, um, it's almost impossible for local law enforcement agencies not to help with immigration enforcement either through their everyday patrol practices or through some of the more formal mechanisms that I mentioned. Wonderful. And if just to remind you all that this is uh, Amada, who's an expert. She has a, an amazing book. If you're hearing things you want to know more about, um, her book is called Protect, Serve, and Deport. We're going to move on to talk about things that are associated with recent events. Um, so our third question to you, Amada, is what is the relationship between local police and Latino and Latino immigrant communities? I'd say that the relationship is complicated and in some, in some ways quite ambivalent. So Latinos and Latino immigrants tend to have very mixed feelings about the police. So there are some reasons to believe that Latino immigrants in particular actually might have favorable opinions of American police. So for example, if you think about the countries that people are migrating from, um, Mexico and other Latin American countries, the police in those countries don't have great reputations, right? They're thought of as corrupt. Um, they can be easily bribed. They don't um, they're not thought of as enforcing laws. So law enforcement um, agencies in a variety of countries from where people migrate don't have very much legitimacy. So when immigrants arrive and have these dual frames of reference, when they're comparing police in the U.S. versus police in their country of origin, they might actually think police in the U.S are not bad, right? Are certainly better, more trustworthy than the places from where they come because you can't bribe them and they mostly show up when you call them and they seem to try to do their jobs. Um, at least that's the things that were frequently said to me when I was doing interviews with undocumented immigrants um, in Philadelphia about their opinions of the police. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, for all the reasons that I mentioned earlier about police participation and immigration enforcement, 
police are not always thought of as um, people that will protect you, right? Contact with the police can put you in danger. And that danger might be getting arrested where you um, might be deported, but also contact with the police can be very expensive. So um, it used to be that in California, for example, and it is still the case in many states that if you're uh, arrested or if you're stopped for driving without a license, your car can get impounded and then you have to pay fines and fees. In my interviews in Philadelphia, people were paying an average of $800 um, after they were stopped by police and were caught driving without a license and they had to pay impound fees, etc. cetera. Um, and so even if contact with the police doesn't result in deportation, these contacts can feel very unfair. Um, another thing that I wrote about in my book was about how police stops with um, drivers without a license, they would take a long time because officers would try to verify people's identities and people didn't have documents that the officers would recognize as valid. So when those stops took a long time, they were often investigative stops. So it's not that the motorist was doing something wrong. They didn't, they weren't speeding, for example. Um, pretextual stops are stops the police officers make to try to investigate the driver. Um, and many law enforcement agencies and police officers do these kinds of stops because they think it's the appropriate and correct way to police because of their training. They're really aggressive. Um, when people are on these long stops where an officer has pulled them over and it seems like it's for no reason, um, people experience these as an assault on dignity. They feel unfair. Um, they feel surveilled. And then of course, people are scared because either the stop can be very expensive or it can result in a person's deportation. And then the last thing that I'll say is that um, people, at least in my interviews in Philadelphia, described a variety of interactions with law enforcement that should never happen. So people described um, police breaking into their houses to execute searches when it wasn't clear that they had a warrant. Um, they described um, being pushed, having guns waved in their faces. Um, these are the sort of most egregious examples. But then they just described a lot of everyday disrespect that they um, experienced where it made them more hesitant to call the police in the future should they ever need to. And of course, like all communities in the US, um, people want to feel safe. And for some communities, that safety um, comes, does not come from the police, but from others, it does. And so, you know, in Philadelphia in particular, Latino immigrants tended to experience street robbery and victimization um, and in some cases wanted more police protection. So when we think about, you know, what Latinos and Latino immigrants think of the police, I just think it's very complex and quite ambivalent. And as you were saying, it's a two-way street because there's also what police think about, what you're also capturing is what police think and stereotype Latinos. And as you had just mentioned, we can see that there's similarities with African-Americans. Um, and in, in this time um, with the murder of uh, George Floyd and many other um, of African-Americans and Latinos, we wanted you to address how are these relationships um, between police and African-Americans, police and Latinos, um, similar and different, um, you know, in terms of police brutality, um, in terms of uh, detention and deportation. So first, I think it's important to recognize that these things will vary geographically because there are obviously Black Latinos, Afro-Latinos, who will experience um, the same sort of police violence that we've seen occur over and over. Um, for others, I think, you know, obviously, 
there's a tendency amongst some, let's say, in popular culture or in media to act as if what's ha what we see the police do over and over, right, which is brutalize and murder Black Americans, um, they think that these are an accident, an unfortunate consequence of policing. Um, they think racial disparities, for example, are an unfortunate consequence of policing and that we should uh, try to make policing more just. But there's no such thing as a just criminal justice system and a just policing system because these institutions are really built on um, racism and white supremacy. From the earliest police forces where their job was to round up um, escaped slaves uh, to enforcing Jim Crow and segregation laws, the police have always been wound up with protecting whiteness and protecting property. Um, so when we think of the parallel experiences with Latinos and Black Americans, um, in some ways they're not parallel at all because no one is harmed as much by policing and policing practices as Black Americans, particularly Black men. Um, because of anti-blackness and racism that's part of policing institutions, but part of American culture more generally. Um, but when we think of the ways that many of these police um, interactions start, they start through these aggressive police practices, these sort of law and order policing practices where police think it's their job to enforce minor violations um, you know, a $20 counterfeit bill, uh, selling loose cigarettes on the street, falling asleep in your car. And those interactions escalate because of the ways that police see every black man as a danger to them um, and, you know, are never, are never um, held to account for their instances of police brutality. But when we think about the ways that these interactions start, um, the same aggressive practices that lead to, you know, police murders, but also mass incarceration. These are the same aggressive policing practices that lead to um, arrests of Latinos and Latino immigrants and mass deportation. Thank you so much, Amada. I think you uh, talked about really critical points that are very much a uh, part of uh, uh, things that in our communities that uh, we continue to deal with and this is very very timely So we want to thank you for your time today and hopefully we will have a mother back with uh, Much more research that she will have in the future Again, this is Celia Lacayo with um, LA social science and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you mm -hmm.